Good afternoon, participants. Thank you for joining uh, this webinar uh, by sparing your time. Uh, you may be aware that uh, uh, Government of India is organizing a global conference on cyberspace 2017. It's a prestigious conference, uh, and this is the fifth conference taking place across the world. And this time, India is hosting this uh, conference. And uh, we are privileged to have some distinguished speakers today uh, to doing this session. The main theme of our GCCS uh, is cyber for all. So I'll just take a few minutes to show you the web, uh, web portal, which is designed. Uh, uh, Raj, I'm just taking the screen for a minute, then I will share the rights to you. Okay. So this is the portal, uh, please. Uh, this is the portal which gives you complete details. If you're interested about GCCS, this is gccs2017.in. Just click this portal. Uh, this portal has a lot of details about the uh, conference. So we can I, we are actually first time connecting even virtually also uh, to the speakers as well as the participants from, from anywhere from the world. And we have some challenges uh, with respect to cyber uh, security. Some contest is also uh, going on. So as of now, the con contest is actually taking place on today and tomorrow. So if you're willing, you can also still take part in the contest. So in order to register for the event, click the icon register you can click uh, this particular event uh, registration fill up all your details uh, especially your personal details and organization details then you can take part in the event anywhere from the world you can either take part physically as well as virtually from any part of the world so with this i'll uh, conclude my uh, uh, small introduction about GCCS. It's a prestigious conference and uh, India was given an opportunity to take uh, uh, conduct this conference. So with this, I will uh, pass on rights of uh, sharing the screen to Raj. Raj, you can take over the scene, uh, screen now. Let me introduce the speakers today. We have uh, uh, the distinguished chief scientist of uh, McAfee, uh, Mr. Raj Samani. He's a uh, uh, McAfee Fellow, and he is a computer uh, security expert and currently working as a chief scientist uh, uh, for McAfee. Uh, and he assisted multiple law enforcement agencies in cybercrime cases, and he is a special advisor to the European Crime Center EC3 in Hague. Raj is uh, has been recognized for his contribution to the computer security industry through numerous awards, including Info Security Europe Hall of Fame, Peter Score Award, Intel Achievement Award, among others. Raj is also co-author of the book, Applied Cybersecurity and Smart Grid, CSA Guide to Cloud Computing, as well as uh, he's a technical editor for many publications. And very importantly, Raj is coming to India and he's also taking one of the main session in GCCS on 2nd 24th. So many of us are even eagerly waiting for his session and uh, in a very uh, informative and interactive session ahead. Now, uh, I'll uh, apart from Raj, we have uh, Indian counterparts uh, also. The MD of Indian McAfee uh, is also part of today's discussion. Krishna Krishnapur is also here, is joined along with his team Raghavan and Vishwa. So with this uh, small introduction, I will uh, you know, quickly pass on to the speaker. But before that, I'll give you a few instructions. Those who are participating, there is a, if you want to raise any questions, there is a Q&A section on your top bottom of your uh, the screen there you have to post your question and answers any technical queries you can use the chat box you can uh, uh, very well uh, type your uh, technical for example i may ask you how is the audio quality now i'm asking you how is the audio quality you can say in chat yes no good very good something like that right and any questions please post only in q and a section the entire Mike, uh, mcafee team is watching your questions they'll also parallelly give you all the answers required and for at the end of the session raj will answer some of the questions uh, earmarked for him and uh, he will take all the questions which is posted in the q and a so with this small introduction i uh, pass on the rights to raj please take over raj welcome raj hi thank you good morning good afternoon good afternoon so raj 
for you it's good morning Thanks. i know it's, you are taking so, it from london good morning i am yeah you can see uh, uh, i don't know if you can it's a wonderful english winter wow that's good well look thank you for the opportunity um i am looking forward to coming back to india um it's been a while so um i'll be there next week so though for those of you that are going to be at the conference uh you know please make sure you come and see me i'm i'm only going to be there for a few hours unfortunately but um i've promised the team that i'll come back and spend some more time in india you know today i thought what we'd do is we'd actually introduce you to something relatively new in fact it was remarkable because the last time i actually came and spoke at, on this particular webinar was during wanna cry and i didn't realize it at the time but wanna cry was the introduction of a new type of attack that we had never seen before now i'm not talking about the way that it infected systems because you know that again the propagation method for wanna cry was unique but but it wasn't novel right you know the the worm type capability was something that we'd seen for about 20 years but really it was about the motivation and the purpose for it now before we start getting into the content i i i wanted to show you something because there's been some you know there's a misconception about what we do and and i can't remember if i showed this on the last webinar or not but just to put it into perspective that the work that you do the work that i do the work that we as an industry do it's bigger than just computers you know there's a misconception that we work in it but the reality is is that the impact of these types of attacks is deeper than for example just an it issue you know historically and in the past when a computer virus or a worm or a ddos or whatever wonderful word that we've created happens the misconception is that it's an it problem and yet the impact of these things now are deeper you know in in one acry's example nhs england themselves confirmed that you know almost 7000 operations had to be postponed or were impacted now put that into perspective 7000 people were unable to get medical care that they had been previously booked in for put that into perspective this was a computer worm and 7000 people were impacted now you know we can we can talk about other cases like if you look in the ukraine for example you know there was a there was a computer related issue which resulted in an entire country having no power and that of course you know when you think about the impact that it has it's significant of course because you know there are traffic lights not working there are you know hospitals and ev every part of your life everything goes dark so why i think and 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 one of the things that i'm going to urge every single person if there's anything you take from this talk is this is recognize the value of what we do and when you're talking to people if don't No, if they look at you and say oh you're in IT like talk to them and explain to them how every part of our society and i mean every single part of our society is dependent upon IT right so so the work that we do is bigger and it's deeper and it's part of our everyday fabric and you know it's it's almost becoming impossible now for us to kind of you know press the off switch in other words being able to go back to manual processes and manual systems now is almost impossible because we are so dependent upon technology and so the work that we do is integral not only for the protection of IT systems but actually for the fabric of society okay so now that i've introduced <coughs> i i guess the broader topic let, let's look at what we mean by appetite for destruction now i was a guns and roses fan and i think that's pretty obvious by the title that we have but wanna cry was interesting because you know, when i gave the webinar um it was what it was in may now so that's 5 months ago we were talking about a ransomware attack and when we talk about a ransomware attack we mean you know the objective is to hold data to ransom and extort money from from people so in other words hey give me money because i now hold your data hostage that's what ransomware is 
And when we saw the WannaCry attack, our focus, our immediate focus was, okay, well, let's make sure that our customers are safe and protected. That's the first thing. And then the second thing was, okay, now that we can ensure that everybody's protected, how can we at McAfee create a free decryption tool? In other words, so the way that it would work is they would use um, a single key to encrypt data and a separate key to decrypt data, right? So it's a locking key and an unlocking key. And, and, and what we said was, and, and one of the things that we often do is we often focus upon how can we create free tools to allow people to decrypt their data. And, and later on, I'll, I'll talk again about one of the projects that we did. So we spent, I would say, about two weeks and it was about 20 hour days. So it was like, it was weekends, it was, you know, it was nonstop. And, and, and our objective was, can we create a free tool to decrypt data? Now, we published a blog on the 8th of June and, and, and the 8th of June was basically the result of all of our research. And it was a 28 page analysis, analyzing the details behind WannaCry because our primary focus here was is it possible for us to be able to in some way shape or form allow people that have been infected with ransomware by WannaCry to be able to to decrypt their data um, without obviously paying the criminals and, and of course we have to remember that the number of cases that that have been reported where people have paid the, the ransom and got their got got a key and got their data back was like you know a handful right if that you know a really really small number so what we knew was at this time was like you know we were dealing with an issue where it was slightly different because like normally people would pay the ransom and they'd get their data back and with WannaCry, that's not really what we saw. It was you paid them, you you know, you paid the criminals, but actually you weren't getting your data back. And I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting was, you know, the message that you get is this particular message here, which says, you know, um, I've already sent decryption keys to many customers, and I guarantee, you know, we will decrypt you for honest customers. But 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 look, send me a message with your unique Bitcoin wallet wallet address an hour before your payment and then you will receive the decryption key more quickly and I'll be honest I think that was one of the things that we kind of looked at and we said well that seems a little odd and, and I remember when we were looking at the the third party analysis so there was a lot of researchers in the industry like sharing their research as they were going along you know going along and and, and what we and, and one of the comments was hey look there is actually a help desk behind this and and, and I think the message infers that there's a manual mechanism associated with this because, you know, it, it's asking you to manually communicate with the criminals. And and this was one of the things that we looked at and we said, well, look, this doesn't seem, this seems a bit strange. Like, you know, you've infected, let's say, a quarter of a million computers. I mean, at the time, we didn't know the number of infections out there, but we knew that there were a lot, you know, just by looking at the I think just by looking at, at, at the Twitter analysis, you know, you can look at like the screenshots people were posting and we knew that this was a big deal. And, and we looked at it and we said, well, look, if you've infected so many computers and you know, you're not sending emails, it's just literally just growing and growing all across the world. Well, why would you put in a manual mechanism to support the, the, the decryption process and actually you know you've got to remember that for traditional ransomware getting people their data back is a key a key, a key um, business uh, proposition for victims of ransomware in other words if you've been infected i need to know that i'll get my data back right there has to be that level of confidence because if there isn't then people aren't going to pay so we kind of began to question the whole concept of wanna cry because this one really was a bit strange and of course remember you're dealing with an issue whereby the propagation in other words the delivery mechanism for wanna cry was probably the most effective that we'd seen for you know decades right at least at least over a decade so 
we really began to kind of ask ourselves this question, which was, well, look, are we, is this really, is this really ransomware? And, you know, I'll be honest, we were, I, I was a bit reluctant to kind of, to kind of make the claim that it wasn't ransomware. And, and, and even today, you know, we, we're still, we're still discussing like, what was the purpose of it? And there's a, there's a number of theories that, that we have. And, and of course, you know, it was supported by the fact that when we began to review and analyze the code, we saw some, we saw some strange behavior. Now, it, it's funny because when we talk about ransomware, when we talk about WannaCry, you're actually presented with a chat window or not a chat window, but a communications mechanism. And, and at the top left, you can actually see that communications mechanism here. It's funny because cybercrime is the only form of crime that gives you a help desk. I mean, think about it. It is, right? You know, the, you actually have the opportunity to talk to the criminals. And, and, and what was interesting was if you look at the communications flow. So, so actually what we did was we put it into a debugger and you can see on the bottom right hand side, that was the message that was sent. So the, the top left is the graphical user interface. In other words, it's what the, it's what the user will see, but, but here's the actual guts of it that was sent back. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but here, what you'll find is you've actually got the unique identifier. In other words, you've actually got the, the criminals have the ability to be able to identify who is talking to them. I know that you're in, I know that you're talking to me. Now, the one thing that they didn't have, though, is the inclusion of this unique identifier for the Bitcoin payment mechanism. In other words, they know who's talking to them, but they don't know who's paid them. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. If you've created a ransomware variant um, and you've put all of this effort into making sure that it's the most effective ransomware in terms of getting like volume of infections than anything else we've ever seen, then why would you, why would this not be there? Why would you not have this, this, this key, key piece of information? Why would you not have the ability to be able to communicate? Uh, no, sorry, not communicate, but why would you not have the ability to be able to identify who has paid your ransoms? I mean, that doesn't that doesn't seem right, does it? And of course, we, we went through like a multiple number of theories. And, and one of the theories that we looked at was like, maybe they were just rubbish. I mean, maybe the people that did it made a mistake. That's reasonable, don't you think? I mean, is it not feasible for criminals to actually write a piece of code and make a mistake? And I mean, I'm sure like there are, there is a number of people here who who are sit, sit, sitting here and listening to this and thinking, yeah, you know, we're a great we're a great development team, and actually we've created mistakes in our own code, and maybe they did create a mistake, but maybe there was a mistake, and I don't think we can rule this out. But I kind of didn't like that theory because when we began to look at the code and 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 really begin to dig down on the code, what we saw was quite clearly there were two. I would say people, but maybe groups, but certainly two separate um, activities of coding. You had one group who were really, really, really good and one group who weren't really, really good. And, and, and that's kind of endemic of every project that we see across the world, right? You get different coders with different capabilities. But if you begin to think about this and you think to yourself, well, okay, if you have a group that are very, very good, then surely maybe what they did was they outsourced the end, the, um, the payment mechanism to the group that weren't so good. But nonetheless, in any software project, you would do end-to-end -end testing. So we kind of said, well, I, we're not sure that it was done badly. And, you know, if you look at the way that the, that the, um, they sanitize the infection. So in other words, like there's no key material left behind. It's not possible for us to reconstruct it. So their ability to be able to rebuild this became very difficult. And so I, I, I'll be honest, I, I, we kind of went against this theory. And, you know, we, 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 
I think we kind of sat on the fence on this one because it, we hadn't seen this concept of I want to call pseudo ransomware, whereby ransomware is being used for another purpose before. You know, yes, we had indications that it was coming, and 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 I'll talk about that later. But you know, we hadn't really seen this before, so we kind of asked the question: said, was it really ransomware? And you know, right now there's theories that it was uh, meant to disrupt. It was a proof of concept, or you know, maybe it was badly written, maybe it was ransomware. But you know, we kind of question it and go, well, we're not so sure because. The amount of money that it made and the fact that it couldn't decrypt and the, you know all of these things kind of led us to believe that we don't think this was ransomware but again we kind of sat on the fence on this one and um what was interesting was just a few weeks later we had uh we had the opportunity to to be more solid with our research and uh you know not pettier i think or pettier not pettier depending on who you, who you talk to um was was an example where we were a lot more comfortable and you know I, I actually put this tweet out straight away because you know we, we we published this research and we were we were a lot more confident in the fact that this was not ransomware and you know we, we kind of made the the claim that this was used for destruction and not ransomware and I, I, I think this is key because like this was one of the first examples where not only us, but but actually there was a broad acceptance that we're beginning to see this concept of pseudo ransomware. In other words, the use of something like like a, a, a uh, an, an encryptor to effectively go out and wipe systems all across the world. I mean, it, it wasn't a wiper in the sense that it, it deleted information, but it was a wiper in the fact that it made things unavailable. So maybe it wasn't a wiper, but nonetheless, this was used for destruction rather than ransomware. And 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 I want to emphasize this here for a second because, like, what you're seeing now is you're seeing the evolution of an attack throughout this industry, throughout my career. We would see an attack and we would say, ah, okay, the purpose of it is this. So you see or you hear about a DDoS attack, you say, ah, okay, the purpose of this DDoS attack is to impact the availability of a particular network. The, the purpose of ransomware is to make money. You know, and determining motivation based upon the tactic that's used has always been has always been a comforting factor, right? We would argue about who did it. We would discuss attribution. But the one thing that we all agreed on was, ah, they're doing, I don't know, like, like let's say they've got a remote access Trojan and uh, they're exfiltrating data. Okay, that's an espionage campaign. We know that's an espionage campaign. But now we're seeing the, the introduction of blended attacks. We're seeing certain attacks being used as smoke screens. And this was a great example. You know, Petia was ransomware but it wasn't ransomware it was a destructive campaign intended to disrupt and it was built for speed and destruction the number of uh, variants that it used or the number of sorry the number of files that it infected was only 65 and when you compare it to say for example the earlier version of petia that was 228 it did everything it could to you know, clear all logs, leave no trace behind. I mean, it was built to go as fast and as quickly as it can and destroy as quickly as it can. And this is this is key here because we were dealing with what we saw as ransomware, but it wasn't ransomware. This is this new introduction of pseudo ransomware. And of course, since, <laughs> since not Petia, it's like been a, a veritable beauty parade of you know multiple other variants and multiple other attacks all designed specifically for the purpose of well that's up to us to figure out and that's the key um just a few weeks back we did some research and the research was about the taiwanese bank heist now i'm sure many of you have seen this and certainly i'm sure many of you have read about the bank of bangladesh attack for example you've read about um you know other banks for example i think i think it was ecuador and others and you know you were dealing with 
a campaign meant to uh, manipulate them, uh, manipulate messages and, and extract money that way. Now, when we began to look into the Taiwanese bank heist, what was fascinating was you know, we got multiple samples for this and we began to review this and there was something that came up. Um, now, of course, what we thought we were dealing with was we thought, and if you look at the headlines, we thought we were dealing with, you know, the theft of millions of dollars in an attack to start basically steal money and drain millions from the bank. And of course, there were some arrests done, but we suspect of the people looking to, you know, like the money mules. But, but you know, you were dealing with something that we thought was a bank heist. But we saw something in the samples that made us well surprised us, I think. Uh, and, and what that was, was the introduction of, of course, ransomware. Now, this hadn't been discussed. This hadn't wasn't a tactic we'd seen before. I don't think we saw this tactic in, in, in any of the previous SWIFT attacks. And all of a sudden, we saw an attack group who had leveraged or, or, or had been successful in the past, but began to introduce a new component to their attacks. And what they did was they encrypted the files of the organization. Now, there was a number of other things that they did, and, and I would I would encourage each of you to go and review the blog. But you know, why I'm kind of focusing on this piece here was what we believe in this particular instance was they had used ransomware, in particular the Hermes ransomware, and they had done that for the sole purpose of getting the IT and security teams to be focused entirely upon the attack it's uh, on, on the, upon the encryption upon the ransomware so in other words it was used as a smoke screen the the objective here was hey what we'll do is we'll get all of the it teams focused over here while we will go out and steal money from here so the, the, the what we're dealing with now is a is a blended attack this wasn't ransomware it wasn't designed to get them to pay the money i mean this is not their objective the objective here was steal money and and get them focused here so this is key because you know if you're an organization today and you're having to deal with you know if you're worried about ransomware or you're worried about ddos and so forth and you and you're facing these types of attacks you know you need to start asking yourself a question well is this really ransomware or is there something else here is it you know is it really a ddos attack or actually are they trying to do something else now i, I mentioned earlier that this was something that we began to I, I guess get a glimpse of and uh this was a piece of research actually done by f secure and, and and you know f secure are a great company they do some tremendous research this was one of my favorite pieces that they did <laughs> i remember i mentioned that you know ransomware has this ability to uh so cybercrime is this ability to be able to create a help desk not only that we, we've seen cybercrime um services that actually give you free chat free chat windows or you know service level agreements and <laughs> you know money back guarantees and stuff so it, it's it's really an interesting area but what they did was they actually had a researcher and the researcher is what you know let's call it christine on the right hand side and she was talking to the criminals and she asked a question and she said look um you know why is the ransom so low and if you look at what the agent says here it says look as far as your income questions because i don't even know how you got it but we're hired by a corporation to disrupt the day-to-day -day business of their competition. So think about that. So, so Christine asked the question, because so that's why the ransom is so low, because you're already getting paid by a corporation. So basically, you're interested in disrupting the business rather than making a lot of money off the ransom. Now, look, there's no way that we can validate this. There's no way that, you know, it's going to be very difficult for us to be able to find out who the agent is, get them to admit under questioning who they were paid by, find the evidence trail, interview the company that was that, that had paid. You know, it, 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 it's a, it's, that's going to be, that would be ideal, but it's going to be a long time before we can do that, if at all. 
but this was done, and I want to say like 18 months ago at least, but it's probably longer than that. And this was the first time that we began to, to get glimpses of pseudo ransomware, the glimpses of cybercrime as a service. And when you think about it, well, what better way to disrupt a competitor than use ransomware? I mean, you saw, you know, there were companies that would be impacted by NotPetya that were talking about write downs of $300 million. I mean, that's significant. That is a significant impact on the revenue of this company. And, you know, it's, a, it's an effective mechanism. By the way, I'm not encouraging you use ransomware to disrupt your competition. I'm just saying it, it is a, an effective mechanism. And of course, you know, we're seeing the evolution of that. And, and you know, we picked this up on a criminal um, forum. And here you have somebody willing to infect a company of your choice via USB. So all about the money, everything that you'd spent, everything, all of the money that you spent on firewalls, on network security, IDS, you know, everything that you'd spent, it's just basically gone because somebody's willing to walk into your organization with a USB stick and infect you with ransomware. And they're willing to do that for money. So, you know, I don't like the word cyber. I'll be honest, I don't like the word cyber. I, I never really have. I think what it does is it makes us lazy and we kind of look at it and go, oh, well, that's a cyber crime. Or, that's not like normal crime. Or, oh, that's a cyber war. That's not, you know, Cyber is just the evolution of traditional traditional things. So, you know, you had crime, now cyber crime. Well, cyber crime is just the evolution of traditional crime. And this is what we're, this is cyber espionage or, you know, or cyber disruption or whatever you want, or, or corporate espionage and so forth. And, you know, this is just the evolution of these types of tactics and techniques. And of course, you know, I talk a lot about ransomware, but it's not just ransomware that's being used this was a real life case of ddos being used and you know america's card room here was a company that were experiencing a ddos attack what happened was they sent out a tweet and said look we've paused all tournaments and the issue kind of subsided for a short period and they said okay we're good again and then of course a few hours later they said hey look we're really sorry but there's been another ddos attack and at the end, at the end, they kind of went, they waved their hands and said, look, we're canceling everything and refunding all tournaments. But the CEO of America's card room contacts the attacker and says, hey, you know, why don't you get, get a job? He said, actually, why don't you get some job? And the attacker replied, oh, this is my job. Some other site is paying me to attack you. And you, you, you're dealing with, you're dealing with the disruption of your business. You're dealing with claims from criminals that they are paid to disrupt your organization. And to put it into perspective, you know, I can run a DDoS against any organization for less than the price of a cup of coffee. That's the reality of the world that we live in is that, you know, realistically, you know, my, my daughter, who's, you know, like nine, 10 years old, she can go out and run a DDoS attack. And, you know, that's how simple it's become. And of course, you can talk to the criminals. I mean, this was actually a live chat session that we got from one of the takedowns that we did. And, you know, even threats of going to the police was laughed off. You know, there was a threat from the victim which says, I won't contact the police, but you have until midnight tonight. Send me the decryption key. I'm going to go bankrupt. And the response was lol that's it that's how that's how little and, and i think this is important because you know we 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 often kind of look at the psychology behind crime and you know most people wouldn't wouldn't think about you know robbing somebody physically you know you wouldn't think about stealing a handbag or or you know mugging someone or robbing somebody but you know to type in a few email addresses into a into a control panel or to hit the enter key you know there's no there's no psychological barrier you don't see the victim and so I, I i think this is a serious issue because 
you know, there's it, it, it's, it's almost like it would appear like a victimless crime because you don't necessarily see the victim physically. And so these are some of the challenges that I think we're going to face. And, you know, this is part of the reason we're seeing the growth in the growth in cybercrime because it's easy to do. And, you know, that, that sense of remorse, I think I don't think is there. OK, so I, I'm going to discuss. Uh, we, we're going to kind of change tack now. Um, I, I know I talked about this during the last presentation, but I want to introduce for those of you that weren't there, how you can begin to fight back. And, you know, one of the things that we launched on the 26th of July 2016 was No More Ransom. And this is an initiative where we have a central repository where people can go if they're impacted by ransomware. And you can go there, you can identify the variant of ransomware you've been hit by, and this is very important. So you can identify what it is. And, you know, it, it's been such a popular site, and, and I didn't show you this, but during the week weekend of WannaCry, we, we had 8 million hits per day. I mean, up to 8 million hits per day when act, went onto the site. And, you know, it, it, it's become this kind of, I guess, this beacon, this lightning rod of this is where we go if we have an issue. And, and unfortunately, of course, there was no decryption tool for WannaCry. I should probably add that. But we did have, um, we were actually successful because we actually created a recovery technique. So if you have been impacted and you still have systems that are impacted, there is the ability to get some of the data back. And over the last 12 months, the site began with, well, there was just a small number of us. There were four partners and uh, two hosting providers, AWS and Barracuda. And we had, how many tools did we have? I think we had seven tools a year ago. We're now at 52. We can decrypt 84 families. We've got 116 partners with um, 37 law enforcement agencies and 79 non law enforcement. And of course, we support 28, 28 languages. And the most important point here is, is that, you know, we have successfully decrypted well, in excess of 30,000 computers and we haven't charged a penny. We haven't like recorded your email address, your IP address. Everything's been done for the good of the industry. And, you know, no more ransom.org is the site. And, you know, I, I would encourage every single one of you to please, you know, go to the website, tell your friends, promote the website, excuse me. And, and if you have the ability to, also, you know, become um, become a member. So you can either be a supporting partner or an associate partner. If you have decryption tools and keys, then you can become an associate partner. If you can promote it, you can become a supporting partner. And also, if you look at my my Twitter feed, and I'll put that up here, um, we also created, and that's Raj at Samani. And uh, if you're interested in cybersecurity for electricity grids, that's my handle for the power grid work. And then uh, my lead researcher, Christiane Beek. Um, but but what I would encourage you all, all of you to do is, if we actually created a free ransomware framework, and so it's actually on my Twitter feed. If you want to download this tool, if if you have decryption keys and you don't want to create a tool, you can actually use that as well. So, uh, and again, that's free to use. Um, but look, the most important thing that I can kind of stress here is it's important you stay up to date with these types of attacks. It's important you stay up to date with what's happening in the industry. This is not an IT issue anymore. This is impacting everyday life. And so I, I'm going to pause for a second. We're going to go through questions and answers. And, you know, I, I had tried to leave as much time as I could for Q&A. So we've got about 20 minutes. And um, looks like we've got a lot of questions. Right. So, all right. Uh, where do we start? Okay. Well, let's let's answer uh, Kriti's answer. So, um, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. I'm glad you thought it was great. So, how effective is, in your experience, are methods like pen testing, vulnerability testing against ransomware? Um, I, actually, I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you bring this point up. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say something which is really controversial, but I don't think security is that hard. I I know what you're thinking. Really, Raj? Like, you don't think security is that difficult? Well, I, let me ask you a question. Um, 
Okay, I can't vote. <laughs> okay, um, you put five in, by the way, that's fine. <laughs> but I'll, I'll put it into perspective. So let, let's take WannaCry, right? How many of you would have recommended for WannaCry you patch your systems? How many of you would, re would have recommended that you segment your networks? How many of you would have recommended that you back up data, right? We knew the answer beforehand, and yet these patches and these fixes weren't applied. In fact, there's still systems today that are still suffering from these, you know, the SMB floor as well. In fact, you know, we, we, we're hearing, actually, I won't say it because it might create a panic. But so the reality is, is that we've known about the basics of security for, well, in, in excess of like, you know, if you look, go back to BS7799 in, well, in the 90s, right, this standard showed us the basic cyber hygiene that was required, you know, back up your data, uh, install antivirus, um, you know, all of these basic techniques, sorry, it's making noise, all of these basic techniques that are integral to protecting your environment. And yet these basic hygiene issues aren't fixed right now. You know, we you, you talk about sophistication of attacks and I'm gonna write a big blog about this because I'm quite angry, but we look at attacks and you kind of assume that they're really sophisticated or you've seen attack, you've seen words like advanced and yet they're not really that advanced. You know, um, the recent blog that we did on uh, APT28, which is the um, a group affiliated with Fancy Bear, you know, this group have been ta talked about as being, you know, the most sophisticated and so forth. And yet they were still sending emails. You know, okay, the technique that they used wasn't, you know, macro laden malware. It was, you know, the, the, the DDE issue from Microsoft, the dynamic data exchange. But, but this was something that we knew about, right? This was something that was blogged like weeks beforehand. So to me, the best defense against every single attack is to do your foundation. And pen testing and vulnerability testing for me is imperative. You know, if you look at if you look at WannaCry, for example, you know that vulnerability would have been picked up during your vulnerability and during your vulnerability testing, and if you would have applied the updates based upon the advice of the of vulnerability test, then you would not have been impacted. So, I'm really glad that you asked that question, and I know I spent quite a bit of time trying to answer that, but for me, it's integral and imperative to have this foundation of cybersecurity to, to, to be there as well. All right, I'm going to start from the top now. His use Ubuntu OS is used in all organizations, so no virus attacks and uh, Windows replaced with their operating system how. Um, okay, so look, uh, Bhagwan, I'm, I'm, so, uh, so, okay, so the question is, and actually I'm going to answer your question in a different way. So, I, you know, I've grown up with computers all my life, and you know, I, I, I've heard theories like, oh well, you know, the Mac OS is impervious to uh, malware, or the Mac OS is, you know, this particular operating system is safe from cybersecurity, you know. And 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 whilst there's a case to be said that there are some operating systems who seem to have more issues than other operating systems. And whilst you can argue that certain platforms have better defenses in terms of like, you know, you look at the, the iOS app store, right? It's, it's, it's a very, 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 very good walled garden. But there's no such thing as like, you know, there's no virus or there's no malware or there's no cybersecurity issue. The reality is, is that criminals will focus or will turn their attention to those operating systems, actually, they will focus on return on investment. If they're going to spend, you know, a 10,000 bucks to create an attack, they're going to focus it on the platform, which is the likely most popular. So I think, you know, we can't use security through obscurity. We can't assume that, okay, because this is an operating system that barely anybody uses and the number of known attacks are minimal or even like we don't know of any yet, that doesn't mean that, okay, because the operating system is there, because of the operating system, we're never going to be impacted. And so I would, I would encourage, 
be aware of the types of risks. So if you're using an operating system that that may not have known attacks, then how are you keeping in touch with the tactics and techniques used, being used by criminals? How is your information feed giving you the data so that if it does, if there is something that does come up, that at least you're aware of it? So I hope that answers your question. Is that ransomware, is it AI based? No, I don't think it was AI based. I think it's manual, it's point and click and it's GUI based. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I, th like I said, I don't think, like most of the attacks aren't that sophisticated. They're really not, and they don't have to be. Um, I, I don't know if you saw this, but NBC put out a TV show and um, they had a, a picture of one of their computers in their in their environment and there was a white piece of stick there was a white sticker underneath it and it just said password nbc <laughs> and, and that's what i'm saying right it doesn't need to be that sophisticated it doesn't need to be that that convoluted it doesn't have to be because you know most people use password one two three four five and they use the same password on facebook as they do on Twitter as they do on eBay as they do in their own corporate network you know like we've got to get the maturity up a little bit and make it more difficult okay hey Raj how this attack were attacked uh hey sorry if not, I, I'm not sure I understand your question could you perhaps come back and and ask the question again that would be that would be great thank you Okay, Dr. Suresh. Hi, good morning, Dr. Suresh. Um, I don't see a question, so hi, good morning. How secure are the freeware available for video conferencing, Skype, TeamViewer, WebEx, Zoom? Um, I look at software, you know, and software, there's, like, as far as I'm aware, um, I don't know, how, do, how do I answer this question? How secure is Skype? How secure is TeamViewer, WebEx, Zoom? Um, do you know, I'll be honest, I don't know of, I haven't looked at the types of vulnerabilities that are reported on them, but I think that that's, that's what, what I would encourage you to do is, in fact, it's a good question. So if you're going to be installing any software, whether it's an app, whether it's a, something like this, then then ask yourself a question. A, do I need it? A, do I need you know, the software on this system, because of course it creates an, a, it increases the attack surface. And also, you know, have a look at the types of vulnerabilities that are being reported on their platforms. Have a look at whether the company actually, you know, when, when vulnerabilities are reported to the platform, see whether they actually do something about it. You know, and if you're, if you're in the procurement space, then like, these are the questions that I think you should be asking, like, okay, how do you de deal with vulnerability disclosure? You know, how quickly are patches made available? You know, uh, like, these are the sorts of questions that I think, like, and of course, I realize your questions probably from a, from a consumer perspective, but I think these are the questions that we should start asking the software organizations that, and the organizations that we entrust and start asking the questions and say, hey, look, what are you doing to, to protect my to protect my platform how to ensure cybersecurity for video conferencing for tele rehabilitation what precautions have to be taken um, well I, I think i kind of touched upon the installation of the software um, you know the one of the things that i do of course is you know we all, all got webcams so obviously i i have a tape over my webcam and so forth um, I, I don't know. I think it's uh, if if you drop me an email, I, I'm sure I can probably find a, a list of um, advisories on on tips to take during video conferencing. I, I, I probably can't answer that right now. I'm sorry. Why is normally Bitcoin used for ransoms? I'm glad you asked. So there's a paper that I wrote um, called uh, Digital Laundry. I think that was Digital Laundry, and we actually, it was myself and Francois, we, we wrote this paper to evaluate, um, we did this paper to evaluate multiple cryptocurrencies and, 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 and we began to look into, you know, like 
what's been the evolution of rans of, of cybercrime and the payment mechanisms and at the time you know liberty reserve had just been disrupted and so we we actually saw a a, a, a migration from liberty reserve to to bitcoin and you know liberty reserve was a centralized crypto uh, a centralized cryptocurrency which was impacted by the fact that you know law enforcement can go to a physical location and disrupt it you know with bitcoin you're dealing with a decentralized structure so you know that's one of the reasons it's decentralized and it's uh, seen as pseudo anonymous and so you know if if you have something which can't be disrupted so easily like like liberty reserve and if you have something which you believe that gives you anonymity then of course you're going to use it but but i want to stress here bitcoin is not bad per se right it is a tool that is used um so and also it's not the only cryptocurrency that's being used but again you know the, the paper's been written so you know i i would encourage you to read that how to protect our network and users well ankush this is um I, <laughs> you've got to start with the basics. You've got to identify your assets. You've got to identify your systems. You've got to identify your data. And then you have to manage the risk accordingly. Um, but, you know, start with ISO 27000 or BS7799 or NIST SP853. Like, it's not that it's not that hard. It, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of work. But, you know, understanding what you want to protect and determining how you protect that is is, is the start. Uh, I think you're going to drop me an email afterwards. I mean, I, I, I use uh, I use Skype, for example. Um, I use FaceTime. I use you know other uh, other tech other tools. What do you think is best to deal with critical vulnerabilities in SCADA? Oh wow, Ramnath, th this is like a this is hard because you know it, like being able to apply patches to systems that require a 100% uptime, you know, this is hard, you know, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to determine the maintenance window. And that maintenance window may only be like half an hour a year or whatever it is. So you may not have the opportunity to be able to apply patches as you would in your IT network. And so what I would encourage you to do is look at mitigating mitigating countermeasures so for example you know can you implement a whitelisting solution on the you know on these on these uh, critical infrastructure devices such that you determine and you define what can run on this system and anything outside that is stopped and blocked but 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 protecting critical infrastructure is very very different and look and I've, I've written a book on the subject and so uh, I know it's a very shameless way for me to promote the book but you can definitely look at the book as well but yeah I, I would look at compensating controls where is cloud data stored and secured you don't know Pritam, that's the challenge with cloud is you don't have the transparency so you're going to have to ask your provider and you're going to have to work with the cloud service provider to ask that question about where the data is stored you know that is the challenge of cloud is that you don't have the transparency of that you would with 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 data stored on prem. How can we stand in that particular just a DDoS and or Tripti? That's that's our challenge. I mean, that is our challenge. We can review the code. We we can you know review the metadata. We can look at you know who was attacked. Um, but that is the challenge that we face. How do we determine how like and, 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 and I wrote a blog called Motivation Roulette. It's on help net security. But have a look at that. I mean, this is the challenge that we're, that we're facing, which is, you know, I, I think what I'm trying to do is encourage people to, you know, if you're facing a DDoS attack, don't just assume that it's a DDoS attack. Look, look, monitor the systems. Have a look what else is going on. Is it a smoke screen for something else? But this is like monitoring and reporting is going to be crucial here. Is power grid attack the ultimate? I don't know. I guess, I guess it depends on who you ask. I mean, you know, like like as a parent, you know, maybe the ultimate would be like a cyber bullying thing, right? That's probably the thing that concerns me the most. You know, if it's a if it's a power grid attack, then yeah, of course that concerns me. But you know, and so 
like I don't think we can we can say well this is number one this is number two this is number three context is going to be key and we've got to have to try to answer like the question like what matters to me and you know for me it's if my kids are targeted then that's going to be my number one thing and and so this is my challenge what if cloud servers are a uh, so, so Chintan, so I think maybe you're asking the question, what if the backup is compromised? And that's definitely a concern. And um, yeah, I think I, I think that that's one of the new attack vectors that we anticipate is, you know, like a surreptitious attack that that compromises the backups and then hits it with ransomware. Like that's the ultimate <laughs> ultimate scare tactic for me. Um, what measures should we take to have an ICT platform for video conferencing? I, I think you and I are going to discuss offline. So thanks. What would you advise someone who's looking to make a career? How should one pursue? Abhishek, I'm so glad you asked this question. This is the most exciting career. This is the most exciting industry. When I finished my master's degree, I did 35 exams in multiple areas of cybersecurity certification and all sorts of things. You need to work, you need to study, you need to interact, you need to get access to information, you need to, you know, all of these things, it's, it never stops, it never, it never sits still. Cybersecurity is always moving forward. So you've got to stay one step ahead. Um, there is no global, uh, Brivesh, there's no global cybersecurity or cybercrime world police. But you see, like Europol are doing a phen phenomenal job, for example, they've got the 28 member states with liaisons. And so you're seeing collaboration on an unprecedented scale. Um, we actually have a recovery tool, uh, Saravan. I, I, we were the first ones, by the way. And you can get some data back for WannaCry. So it does work. <laughs> so um, uh, MP debate, uh, go to um, nomorransom.org. And we've got some advice on for everybody to be able to prevent these types of attacks. And Ying Chu, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Monika, um, I haven't done. We haven't done an analysis of you know every types of attack. So I, I can. It's only. It will only be a guess. I'm sorry. Um, ISO HIPAA. I, I, you know, I, I think like having a framework and determining the basic governance, like whatever you use, like, you know, if, if you're a, if you're in the financial services, then you'll use PCI. I, I've always been a big fan of ISO 27K, but that's just because I've used it. But but honestly, using something is key. Um, what do you think is needed to deal with the critical vulnerabilities in SCADA? Wow, Ramna, that's a big question. Um, buy my book, maybe, first of all. <laughs> um, but, but you need to start identifying your assets. I think that's what I said, like, you know, protecting your environment begins with the basic foundations. Is there a penalty for hackers? It depends on what jurisdiction they're for. Yes, um, yes, the details about Petia are on Twitter. In fact, everything that we do, we always post on, on, on Twitter as well. There are specific malware that, yeah, I, I, we, we do, Monika. Um, Shamoon was one example. So there is still those attacks that are very obvious, but we're seeing the evolution of these attacks where determining motivation is harder. How can I know if any payload is working? Um, well, if it's ransomware, you won't be able to gain access to your data. I mean, it's it, it'll be encrypted. Uh, so, so, Dan, so the first thing they need to do is do the basics, you know, install antivirus, update, use a firewall, don't click on open emails. I mean, it, it, it's 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 like that. Um, not yet, no mobile yet. Um, and becoming smarter. Well, you don't, but we don't know. And 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 I think that's a challenge for us as a society is how can we get people to, how can we get people to stay off crime and realize that there are penalties and i think that's something that we as a society need to start doing is like like getting people behind bars i think is 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 is, is, is the way that you do that uh yes that's very well documented ash ashatosh um if you if you can't find it i'll, I'll send you the links for that state-sponsored cyber heist um there is no such so, so state-sponsored attacks are not more advanced than than cybercrime and vice versa 
that you know i think it's up to government to determine who is behind it we just need to protect against it and, and quite frankly like even if you're not very good at what you do you can basically hire people to do the attacks for you so i uh, you know i i think like anybody that says well state sponsored are more advanced than x or y it's it, it, it it's incorrect now and regularly update your os's uh Pragnesh, i think i answered that question um okay i'm not going to finish these questions off so my, my apologies um i know in the past we've tried to answer the questions uh offline so i'll i'll try to do that but but honestly um i, I may not get a chance to do that so come and see me next week and um uh feel free to connect on twitter and, and stay up to stay up to speed so hey i'm going to pass over back to the team uh thanks uh raj it was wonderful session you took it's very informative uh as you rightly said uh all these questions uh can be answered directly raj is coming to india and uh He's going to take a session in uh, GCCS 2017 on 24th morning. It's a very important session on uh, cyber security. And also we uh, request those who wanted to participate, that you also can participate virtually uh, to this conference. Please register yourself as I showed you in the website. Uh, one more time also I will show you. And uh, today's uh, whatever Raj's presentation he has shared with us is already been uploaded in our community. Uh, Raj, I will take screen for a few minutes and I will show them how they can download. Okay. See, they, uh, we have created a community for you. Uh, this is called uh, GCCS community. Uh, you have to come to lms.negd.in. Just type in. There's a tab we have created, GCCS login. It's a public uh, login uh, with your Gmail account, any login, you can log in here. Click here, then just register yourself. You don't, if you have an account already, you can directly log in. Or if you don't have, you can create a one. Then log in uh, creating this one. And uh, we already uploaded. I'll just show you that. So now you are able to see uh, this site where you can, once you log in, you will be able to see this. There you see uh, already we have uploaded Appetite for Distraction. So you can just click and download if you wanted to download this presentation, which is very useful. And you can download as Raj already told you, he has given, shared the Twitter handles also. You can be in touch with him also. He's very generous. Sometimes he answers directly by himself. I reached him out through Twitter very first time. And uh, apart from that, we thank uh, Raj for this wonderful uh, session, sparing your valuable time and taking uh, this session, very informative session on part of GCCS 2017. And we are looking forward to have you uh, on uh, 24th. And definitely that session is going to be a wonderful one. And uh, I also thank the Indian team of McAfee, Krishnapur, uh, Raghavan, Srinivas Raghavan, and uh, Vishwa for uh, continuously uh, helping us out with uh, their endeavors. And also thank uh, Ms. Petra and coordinating and helping us uh, through Raj's uh, no, office. So thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the session. And uh, you have any doubts, you can uh, still post us your questions. And all your questions will be answered in the community. We will be, yeah, in the discussion forum right now, whatever I showed you, here you can able to see the discussion forum. In this discussion forum, all the question and answers will be uh, posted uh, later date from the once we receive uh, from Raj's office all the answers. Thank you very much for uh, taking your time and uh, joining us. Thank you, Raj, one more time. Have a good trip, safe trip to India. Looking forward to see you physically here. Thank you. We'll close the session. Thank you. Bye.